Hello everyone and welcome to our fourth Never meeting. Today we'll be talking about climate change. We've got a whole host of speakers, two from Never and Sir Rory Bristow, one of the ELN Senior Associate Fellows. Opening the shop today is going to be Laurie. Um, he's, as I said, now a Senior Associate Fellow. Before this, he was the British Ambassador to Afghanistan, the Regional Ambassador to COP26, to a whole host of areas that he can probably detail off faster than I can. Loads of other, um, like, minist not ministerial, wrong word, Foreign Office Post before that. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about you know, geopolitics, climate diplomacy, um, essentially the zesty topics that I've got us here today for this meeting. So over to you, Laurie. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Ethan. Um, and thanks very much for the invitation today. Uh, look, what I'll do is speak very, very briefly about a few things, more to put some questions out there that we might pick up in the discussion than to offer any answers. Um, but maybe the place to start actually is um, the personal biography and how it basically maps on to what have been the you know the big questions in foreign policy and international policy over the last three decades um, and you know I, I hope we'll see why, why why i'm doing this um so look basically I, I joined the foreign office out of university in 1990 um that's not coincidental that was the year that the cold war was ending um so you know i'd grown up in a world where you know you had um, superpower confrontation between the US and the Soviet Union and the, um, uh, their various allies and supporters. That all finished um, in the year that I was starting my working life. And um, looking back on it, it's still we're still working through the consequences of those immense changes. I should just mention, by the way, that um, you know, 1989 was um, uh, an important year elsewhere in the world as well because of the events taking place in China um, and the Tiananmen Square demonstrations and the sort of different paths um, that were taken in the Soviet Union and in China to deal with that. So I worked a lot on Russia. Um, along the way, I also worked a lot um, on what came to be known as liberal interventionism. Um, so for the purposes of this discussion, um, I was working on the planning for the invasion of Iraq and the post-conflict um, uh, administration of Iraq in 2003. And of course, was um, in at the end, I mean, the very bitter end in Afghanistan um, in August 2021. Um, uh, in between, I worked a lot on counterterrorism. So this was the, the consequences of what happened on 9-11-2001 and the extent to which um, non-state conflict displaced great power competition for a large part of that three decades. And of course, like any other diplomat of my generation, I spent large chunks of time working on the European Union. Um, and on the UK's still unresolved relationship with its European neighbours and partners. And of course, behind that, our relationship with the US and our sense of ourselves in the world. Um, and as Ida mentioned, um, in 2020, I was working on the preparations for COP26, so the, um, uh, you know, the climate conference in Glasgow. Um, so I think you know, if, if we take nothing else away from this bit of the discussion, I think the single thing I want to point, point out to land um, is that we are in the midst of a poly crisis. Um, you know, multiple overlaying political, economic, societal crises um, that create a more complex and unstable set of risks and policy dilemmas than at any time I can remember in any of that 30 years. So um, in terms of climate change, you know, we've got COP28 coming up in Dubai in November, December. Um, I mean, you know, COP28 is a conference. What stands behind this? Um, is the now evident fact that time is running out very rapidly for us to stand any chance at all of staying within the Paris targets. So, you know, limiting global warming, warming to 1.5 degrees. Uh, to do that, the world needs to be on a downward trajectory within the next five to six years, and it needs to achieve net zero no later than 25 years from now. That's a very, very tall order. Um, and, you know, as each year ticks by, it becomes a taller order. Meanwhile, geopolitics is back big time. We've got no choice but to deal with that. Um, you know, my specialism is Russia. Um, I spent large chunks of yesterday trying to work out what on earth was going on in Russia yet again. Um, you know, this is going to be with us for some time. And it's a first order security issue for the UK, for Europe, for the US, I would say, for the world. Um, but we're also having to get our heads around um, those urgent and pressing systemic threats. So what we're also seeing here is a competition for the attention of policymakers and for resources, and alongside that, dilemmas. So what I mean by that, I mean forced choices, quite often between two or more bad options. Which are the ones we're going to focus on and which ones we're going to put aside, even if we're, uh, whether or not we're actually choosing to do that. 
So energy security is back on the agenda. Um, until 18 months ago, Europe sourced a very large part of its primary energy supply from Russia, you know, oil, gas, to some extent coal, um, and for some civil nuclear. We're now completely in a different world. We're using the instruments um, of sanctions and price caps to suppress Russia's ability to resource its war. What's happening also on the back of this is um, a big problem around food security. Um, so, you know, between them, Russia and Ukraine are two of the world's major exporters of food, but also fertilizer. So the Black Sea grain deal sought to reduce the impact of the war on the global south, but also to limit Russia's ability to weaponize food prices and availability. Um, and as you'll have seen, Russia's pulled out of that, um, that deal in recent weeks. Another point which is not primarily about foreign policy, it's about what it needs for the low carbon transition to happen. Um, this of course depends more on domestic policy and industrial capacity than it does on foreign policy. Um, so what follows from that is that you know, for the low carbon transition to happen, we're talking about key players in the supply chains, including owners of intellectual property, owners of manufacturing capacity, and the big research and development centers. And there are some very, very big players in there. If I list a few of them, the US, the European Union, China, India, you start to see the connection um, between the, the different areas of policy and the dilemmas being set up here. So in the wake of COVID and the deteriorating geopolitical relationships between China and the West, that's looking ever more complex, even more complex than it did in 2020. Add to that the domestic economic and social policy challenges for all of us of re-engineering our economies, um, you know, the, the dislocations of getting out of high, high carbon um, uh, industries. Going on in parallel with that, there is tech, technological change of a, a magnitude, a speed, and a depth of, uh, of, that I really just can't remember in my working life. So artificial intelligence, of course, at the top of the pile, but also the question of regulation of emerging technologies. We're only really beginning to get at the scale of the problem, but it's clearly of fundamental importance in both economic and national security terms for everyone. We did have a system, uh, we, we called it in the West, we called it the rules-based international system for regulating competition and for encouraging cooperation. There's maybe a bit of a debate that we could have about what the rules-based international system actually is, um, you know, who owns it, um, where it came from, what's happening to it. I think for the, the purposes of this discussion, it's just worth bearing in mind that the UNFCCC, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, is part of the rules-based international system. But the rules-based international system is in trouble. My personal view is it probably actually just ended um, in um, a form that we would recognize. Um, so what we've got at one level is Russia, a P5 state, a co-architect of the post-war international system, seems intent on testing it to destruction. China is in a rather different place. Um, it's clearly interested in rewriting the rules-based international system to suit its own emerging interests. Um, and in the last week, the BRICS, you know, the, um, the, uh, the, um, the grouping of Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, um, at their meeting this week, they made very explicit the ambitions of current and aspirant members to reshape the, what we call the rules-based international system to reflect their understanding of their interests which are more or less explicitly not aligned with the interests of the West across a whole range of uh, fields. So alongside that, what we're also seeing is very rapid and far reaching realignments, uh, both um, uh, political, economic and security. One I'm particularly interested in is the Indo-Pacific Quad. Um, so US, India, um, um, uh, Australia, what's the fourth one, can't remember, um, Japan. Um, you know, very much focused on um, uh, um, responding to the security challenges for those countries as they see them at the rise of China. What we've also got going on is an awful lot of what's called multi-alignment, frankly, hedging. Um, and I think the key player to watch there is, is India. So not wishing to be drawn into, driven into one block or another. For me, there's a question here about what happened to um, expectations um, in the West and in the US um, of leadership of all of this, you know, our, our view of ourselves and what role we play in the world. Why, for example, are so many countries in the global South prepared to vote with us in the General Assembly in support of Ukraine and against Russia, but so few are 
are prepared to take action against Russia alongside the G7. There's something going on there. China, where is China going? So you know, China has for some time been talked about as you know, the, um, the, the emerging superpower, the emerging great power of the 21st century. China though has problems. Um, there are demographic issues. Um, there is faltering growth alongside. Right, so unfortunately, I think Laurie's internet might have briefly died. Um, I imagine he was probably going towards the end of his comments, but what we can do is we can pause for now and hopefully we'll get him back online again at some point soonish. Um, and then he can just finish off after someone else's presentation in the meantime. Um, and annoying us because he, he was getting really good just that I was excited at the edge of my seat. Um, but in that case, whilst we're waiting for him to keep the show on the road, I'm going to send him an email. Um, but I'd like to introduce a little bit earlier than anticipated, um, Jia Chong. So Jia Chong is a NEVA member at the University of Ghent, studying a PhD, primarily focusing on climate governance and great power competition. So luckily, it's a very similar topic to what Laurie was talking about just then. Um, so the floor is yours, Jia Chong, and I'm just going to get in touch with Laurie and make sure that everything's OK at his end. Thanks. Uh, so, can you hear me now? You're, you're fine. You're, you're all yeah. fine and dandy. I think it was just Laurie's internet. I could see for the last five minutes, he seemed to be sort of like slowing on the video a little bit. <laughs> so I imagine something was going to happen, but luckily it was only right at the end rather than at the start. So yeah, it's all yours. Uh, okay, okay. So, I will start. Actually, my research uh, topic is more about... Uh, uh, Free power relations, especially in some specific area like this one, climate change, and also some nuclear weapons, etc. But uh, today, I would like to share with you um, some of my research about major power in climate governance, especially the relation and the role play of the U.S., China, and the EU, which is considered as a very typical relationship for climate governance. And we all know that addressing climate change is a very cooperative work. So only with the participants build a very nice coalition is it possible to consolidate the climate regime, um, which is composed mainly by UNF, C, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. As for the latest one, the Paris Agreement, it is the first uh, global emission reduction agreement covering nearly 200 countries and regions. And also when it comes into effect, it become the second bending agreement after the Kyoto Protocol under the UN frame. And there is a very clear long-term goal, which is to limit the increase of global temperature to within two degree and also achieve the net zero emission in the second half of this century. So subsequently, um, there are many major powers proposed the very ambitious goals. For example, the European Commission launched its Green Deal to try to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2050. And also um, there is no uh, net net zero emission by 2050. And also China launched its carbon neutral plan and uh, commit to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2060. And also the US, the UK, Japan, Canada, they all have like the same, uh, in, same net zero emission commitment. And also there are some other major powers like Brazil, India, South Africa, and, and and also Russia, although they don't have that specific role, uh, goals, they all participate very actively in this global uh, climate governance. But actually, within these powers, I think the United States, China, and the EU are the th three most influential ones, and they are also major greenhouse gas emitters around the world who enjoy a very Pavot rose, and also actually there is a strategic uh, triangle among them. And uh, although they adopt a very different policies towards each other, they all agree that they are partners in climate change issues, and they all have very common ambitions. And also they share a very common role, which is the leader in climate governance. For example, the EU has been a leader for 
quite a long time and it occupies a very central role in the negotiation and implementations. And also upon rejoining those efforts against climate change, um, President Joe Biden always want to reestablish the EU leadership in this area. As for the EU, it has been the leader by example, the mediator and uh, participants for these negotiations and coalition. And also it crafts itself as a normative role model with advanced tools and policy, policy for climate change. And some researchers even create a very new word to describe the important role of the US, which is mediator, means leader plus mediator. And also as for China, uh, after being a rule taker for quite a long time, President Xi pres uh, presented China's role as the leader at the 19th National Congress of CCP. And our, according to him, China is taking a driving seat, driving seat in climate change uh, governance, and it has become a very important participant, contributor, or even torchbearer in the climate cooperation and uh, the ecologic civilization. So actually, with this above introduction, it is supposed that climate change should go pretty well with their leadership and cooperation. However, as we all know, there are always disparities and uh, concerns among them. And this time we just start with China because it has faced many criticism, for example, for its adopting a very selective approach for its climate governors notably through its strategy of pick and choose. So what does it mean? And here we need to mention China's role, uh, a two-faced role when it adopted its policy. Because China always describes it at the same time a developing country, and this is the weaker side of it. And also it is an actor pursuing higher international status or more global influence, and this is considered to be a stronger side. But this seems quite ridiculous and controversy for other stakeholders, including the EU and the US. Because that's why China's commitment is always questioned by these actors, and they always argue that China's integration into climate governance does not match it, match its uh, growing economic prominence or its international status. And these are the criticism for China and also for the EU. It counters some problem for integration, especially after its enlargement. And I think this is also related to its self role perception because the EU always presents itself as a united front against climate change. However, in fact, uh, the EU's supranational policy making can just allow it for a quite long term uh, development for policy. However, this weakness of co coordination between member states will always reduce the effectiveness of implementation. And this is the concerns for others, other actors. And also for the US, although it has rejoined the Paris Agreement in 2021, it always faced blames and diminished global influence due to its act, this action. And this leaves a leadership void and to increase the expectations for EU and China. And all of this is the challenges for the EU, uh, sorry, for the US. And, and also the EU and US has issued rapidly uh, a joint statement in 2018 to emphasize their dedication for multinationalism, cooperation, and to also share responsibility to show that they are unlike the US. And, and also, as we all know, not only China and the EU, but also Many other stakeholders have expressed their disappointment 
for this action. And this is a uh, quite stark for the US. And also in my research, I just uh, find out this kind of disparities seem mainly from the asymmetries of these countries, uh, for example, including the asymmetries of understanding of standard and uh, also of the regime, because they have uh, very uh, sometimes like the misperceptions, lack of communication and misinformation, especially from news and social media, and especially China and like the EU and the US has a very different historical trajectories to industrialization. So they have very different understandings of some climate change related industry company and practices and also they have very different understanding and standard for some principles of Paris agreements, like nationally determined contribution, some uh, common but differentiated responsibility and uh, uh, respective uh, capability, this whole principle. And they all refer to their different views on some normal and global values, universal values, like uh, e uh, equality, justice, or sovereignty, they, these are all different. And this is also related to the third asymmetry, which means the region one, because uh, they have very different form of government. Some are United Nations and some are super national power, power and some have very, very multi-level governance and all of this lead to very different ways to climate governance and different willingness of sovereignty or power transfer. And they are all obstacles for this climate governance. All right, so in conclude, uh, I would like to say to solve this problems, I am quite interested in some kind of uh, important role of other stakeholders, for example, NGOs or cities. Uh, for example, I am recently I'm re really interested in the in the how to say the, those roles of cities. For example, we can just extend this govern governance from up to bottom to create some partnership between cities of different countries, but with quite similar size or uh, development level, and to use these smaller units to create a bottom-up structure to get rid of some uh, ineffectiveness uh, from the global level. Um, but this is just uh, a point I learned recently from some public and city diplomacy. So if there are some experts here also interested about this, we can just talk about it later. And I'm sorry that because of the time limit, I should uh, say it quite fast. So if anyone have some ideas, maybe we can talk it later. And thank you for listening. And that's all. Amazing. Thanks so much to you, Chung. That was brilliant. Um, and yeah, once again, if anyone wants to engage with that, I, I like the idea of like <laughs> cities around the world combining and having these like, you know, how, how can we solve the problems of, you know, asymmetrical government? Not everyone's got the same levers. Um, but yeah, thanks very much. That's really interesting. I'm sure we'll be talking loads about it later in the group discussion. Um, can I just check, um, Laurie, are you able to hear and see and speak to us at the moment or is are we still encountering technical difficulties? I've had the mother of all technical difficulties at this end. I, I don't know what happened, but basically everything just shut down. We, we've all been there. We've all been there. I can remember once it froze on me, but my mouth was kind of like semi-open at the time. I was catching flies for like 20 minutes on the Zoom camera. It wasn't very attractive. Um, but um, if you can cast your mind back to about 10 minutes ago, uh, I think you were just getting towards... I'm trying to remember now. I was I was hooked by um Jia Chung. Do you remember where you were? Because I'll have to give you like five to two or five minutes to wind up before we move on to Clara. Um, I I don't actually remember where I dropped out. Uh, can anyone remind me? Uh, climate okay. governance, Russia, US, and China. That's the last uh, note I took. You were you were right. discussing this, right? Okay, just looking at me notes. Um. 
Okay. Yeah, so maybe just to recap a bit, um, you know, what, what we're facing um, is, you know, trying to progress climate change goals under the UNFCCC at a time when, um, you know, there's just an almost limitless um, range and complexity um, of other things going on, um, you know, that uh, are frankly, you know, creating even greater pressures um, on policymakers and on resources and so on. Um, and um, you know, just to sort of step back a little bit from foreign policy, um, you know, to achieve the low carbon transition, um, you know, these are primarily questions of domestic and industrial uh, policy, um, as well as of international policy and security policy. So you're very quickly here into discussions about key players in supply chains. So owners of intellectual property, owners of manufacturing capacity, um, the, uh, the centers of research and development in the world. Um, you've got very big players um, in there, I and mean, the US, India, China, and um, uh, the European Union um, you are right at the top of the pile. Um, but what you've also got um, is de deteriorating geopolitical relationships. So preeminently between China and the West, um, looking even more complex than it did in 2020, which is saying something. Um, so added on to that, the, um, you know, the domestic um, economic and social policy challenges of re-engineering economies. Um, I'm not sure whether I've mentioned this before, but technological change is also becoming a real driver um, of both um, domestic policy and of thinking around international security policy. So of course, most people will be familiar with the debates around artificial intelligence and the regulation of artificial intelligence. Frankly, we're only beginning to get a sense of the scale of the question and the problem, but it's very clearly of fundamental importance in both um, economic and national security terms. Um, the key point, though, um, I think, is um, uh, to talk about the rules-based international system itself. So what is it? You know, the UNFCCC is clearly part of it, um, very important part of it. Um, the, the, the point for us to think about, though, is, um, frankly, did the, um, the rules-based international system just actually end? So looking at it from a Russian perspective, Russia perspective, what we're seeing is a P5 member state, one of the architects of the post-1945, post-1991 architecture, actively trying to destroy it and undermine it for you know, reasons of their own. Equally interesting, you've got China, the emerging great power of the 21st century, interested in rewriting um, what we in the West call the rules-based international system to suit its own interests. Um, and um, very important set of um, discussions going on in the BRICS earlier this week, um, where you know the current and aspirant members of the BRICS are very clear that they want to reshape the rules-based international system to reflect their understanding of their interests, which are more or less explicitly not aligned with the interests of the West, who essentially you know built the RBIS as we currently understand it. So we're seeing some very rapid um, and far-reaching realignments in security policy. Um, I'm not sure whether I've got as far as mentioning the Indo-Pacific Quad, um, specifically you know, a, a, an attempt to address the security issues for um, US, India, Japan, Australia arising from um, how they understand the emergence of China, the emerging challenges of China, but equally important, multi-alignment and hedging. Um, and India, I think, is the most important example there um, of what that is starting to look like. Um, for the West, there's some big questions here about our leadership, our influence in the world. One of the things I found really curious, um, to say the least about the last year, is how many countries vote with us in the General Assembly in support of Ukraine and against what Russia is doing. 140 countries in the General Assembly two years running, but how few of those countries in the Global South prepare to take specific action against Russia. Um, in particular, of course, sanctions, um, where the G7 is driving sanctions rather than the UN system. So to finish up with a couple of things to, to focus on the outlook for US-China relations, extremely complex, becoming more complex. The frictions are getting harder to manage. Um, many of the policy dilemmas are there for the Europeans as well in slightly different form. Key for the West, um, managing the transatlantic relationship and the relations, uh, the wider relations among the democracies, the liberal democracies. Big success story in the last 18 months, I think, has been how far we've managed to find commonality of purpose um, and common uh, policies to respond to the invasion of Ukraine, but the underlying tensions haven't resolved. And if you want to try a thought experiment, imagine doing the last 18 months with Trump in the White House. Um, and you know, we've got an election next year. Um, in the US. Um, 
perhaps the most important point of all to end on. So foreign policy, foreign policy is always driven by domestic policy. What other things that are happening um, in the democratic societies and the authoritarian societies that are producing the policy choices um, that we're seeing? Uh, for the US, of course, I mentioned big election moment coming up. Um, you know, Trump didn't come from nowhere. People voted for him. In the UK, um, Brexit didn't come from nowhere. People voted for it. Um, and, you know, there are underlying questions there, not quite the same thing um, in authoritarian countries as it is in the democratic countries. But I think one of the really big questions for all of us is how do you map um, the things that you need to do in foreign policy onto what's happening in your domestic policy? And how do you build a case for very expensive, very difficult and dislocating policy choices in the climate change field? Thanks. Amazing. Thanks so much, Laurie. And I'm really glad you managed to finish at the end as well. We were all on the edge of our seat before you got cruelly torn away from us. <laughs> but um, you made some really interesting points there. And unfortunately, you missed a little bit of Jia Chong's um, chat earlier. But I know you must have caught Glimmins because I saw you in the chat. But um, I've got a few questions for you both later. So I hope you're ready for them. Um, and now we're going to move on to our third speaker. We've got Anna Clara Botto, Clara. Um, Clara is really involved in some climate change mitigation technology. So she's going to be talking a little bit about solar radiation modification. There we go. I have to keep writing it down and saying it out loud. Um, and also the importance of young people's voices in it. So Clara, the floor is yours and feel free to put your presentation on that. You said you'd happily prepared for us earlier. Yeah, thanks, Eden. Um, before I just wanted to clarify that actually SRM shouldn't be considered as a mitigation strategy. Um, I know there is a debate whether it falls inside either mitigation or adaptation, but I think we're looking at it as another, a separate thing. Because um, when we talk about mitigation, we're basically, we would like to address the root cause of the climate crisis and SRM wouldn't touch on that. Um, it would be like a fix um, or maybe it would buy us some time um, so that, that can't really be put inside the mitigation box, but I think it was good that you wrote as mitigation because then we could already take, um, can, over, we could already talk about this, um, and prevent some other questions in the end. So wait, I will try to share my screen now. Um, can you see it? Okay, great. Um, so basically a bit of the background of of how I ended up dealing with SRM. Well, for the past eight years, I would say I've been engaged in different processes around environmental um, governance or just grassroots environmental activism. So from arts to um, formal politics. I'm originally from, from Brazil, but I've been based here in Europe for the past two years. And since last year, I've been part of this um, Youth Climate Voices program from the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative. Um, I don't represent them. This was only a project to um, gather youth inputs on, on SRM or solar radiation modification. And I had the freedom to conduct my own outreach activities on, on the topic. And that took me um, from going in person to Feedworks on, on SRM at the Great Barrier Reef um, to being in workshops looking into existential risk and SRM at Cambridge. So I've been engaged with different organizations that are looking into SRM. And that brings me to the current, my current state, which is um, developing this organization called SRM Youth Watch, uh, because we don't have enough um, awareness of SRM, even amongst the youth climate bubble and youth environmental bubble. Um, so if we don't have this awareness in those bubbles, um, we also don't expect the general population to know about SRM. And so with this Youth Watch, we hope that we can make this topic known to people from different areas. So to those that are studying, um, I don't know, atmospheric sciences, to those that are studying linguistics, because SRM um, is connected to all of those different areas, both just the philosophical talks about it, but also if the time comes for actual deployment, we need people 
from those different fields of knowledge to be aware of it. Um, and so just a quick presentation that I already had ready. I think many of you might already know what SRM is. So I'll just um, I'll just talk as fast as I can. Um, for those of you who don't know what SRM is, um, basically there we have different solar radiation modification technologies, but the goal of all of all of them is to reflect the sunlight uh, back into space, which would in turn reduce the Earth's temperature. Um, that can come in different forms. So these are only uh, for different examples. Um, like I mentioned, I was in the fieldwork of marine cloud brightening, which is literally, as the name says, brightening the clouds. Um, and the only field work that we have so far going on in the world is at the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and the other technologies are mostly in still either lab work or just research, basically trying to understand if they can actually build the, the, the technology and all of the equipments necessary. Um, but then all of those SRM technologies they have the same goal in the end, but different impacts. So some of them would have a global impact while others would have a more regional impact. Um, so we put all of them in the same box of SRM, but they're very different from each other and their implications are also very different. Um, if you're looking at a technology in the Arctic, that's completely different from something that will work in, in the tropics. So, um, yeah, it's very diverse and we don't really have the time to touch on each one of them. And I also don't think I would have um, the expertise to talk about the techno technical details of them. Um, but basically what brings us to the whole SRM topic is the climate crisis, of course. Um, but we still can't really assess all of the the risk risk factors that we have when we talk about SRM. Um, but if we are to put um, two different scenarios, we can talk about the world without SRM or with. Without, we already know that we're not heading to a bright future in terms of, of the climate. And the IPCC reports show us that even if we stopped emitting um, greenhouse gases today, the temperatures would still rise. And then the problem is that some ecosystems or even some uh, communities might not be able to withstand um, this, um, this, those higher temperatures. And we also can't really predict, although we have climate models that are pretty good, we can't really predict what the, the impacts would be. Um, so SRM would come as an alleviation mechanism um, in those scenarios um, that we have super high temperatures and we want to prevent catastrophes from from happening but then at the same time if we use if we deploy srm mechanisms we might also have to bear some negative impacts um from an increase of rainfall which can cause floods to also a decrease of rainfall which can um prevent um, humans from accessing water in places that already struggle with um, water access. Um, again, I don't really have the time to touch on all of the impacts that might be caused, but this is just the dilemma that we have of a world with or without SRM. Um, when it comes to governance, it's also a big um, question mark because we don't have a specific um, UN mechanism to regulate or international intergovernmental mechanism to regulate SRM. We do have some frameworks where we could base ourselves um, to think of how to govern SRM, but it's something that we haven't really touched upon. And as we all know, uh, international cooperation is not the easiest thing. And because those technologies might have the potential um, to impact the whole planet, um, how are we going to govern those technologies? And then I personally believe that's also why we should be talking about those technologies, because it's not that we have all of the answers and precisely because we don't have the answers, that's why we should be talking about them. Because if the time comes where we, where we, we're really um, in a situation where a country um, 
unilaterally decides to deploy. If we haven't talked about them before, how are we going to face this situation? Um, so ideally, we should already be preparing ourselves before countries decide um, to deploy those technologies on their own. And considering all of the transboundary effects um, that it could have, we we don't want to start any more conflicts because of because of that. Um, also, two things that come up when we talk about SRM and specifically on research, which is the state that we're at right now, um, is the moral hazard and the moral imperative. And basically, the moral hazard is that we would be focusing our resources on something that's not really addressing the root cause of the problem. As I said, it's not a mitigation strategy. And some people think that there is a slippery slope of if we are researching this, that means that this will automatically lead into um, deployment. Uh, but on the other hand, some researchers say that we have a moral imperative to research about SRM because the situation is not um, good for the whole planet when it comes to climate. And and so those technologies might might actually prevent us from facing more severe consequences of, of the climate crisis. Um, we have several challenges when it comes to governance and I mean, we can we could add so many others to this list, but basically we don't have a global thermostat. Uh, we don't have someone that controls the global climate. Uh, so how are we to decide on who's going to regulate those technologies? And if if someone needs to deploy it, who will over the process will be made? Or for how long will deployment last? How are we going to prevent uh, termination shock, which is a phenomenon of what happens when you um, stop using those technologies? Um, so yes, we have lots of challenges. <laughs> And we also have several stakeholders' perspectives to consider. So from indigenous approaches to, to the planet, as in we should really be looking at the earth as this one system that we don't have the power to, to control and shouldn't be trying to control, um, to startups that are independently trying to solve the problem and, and creating SRM mechanisms where the responsibility is shifted to the individual. So there was a huge um, case in the US this year where this startup um, created weather balloons and was selling it to people, um, but they they didn't ask for the Mexican government um, permission to test it on the Mexican territory. And then Mexico just banned all of SRM research. Um, so we have several things going on in, around SRM um, and we have very strong um, opinions about it. But like I said before, the point is not that we polarize, uh, we get polarized in the SRM discussion, is that we find a space where we can talk about it and people can voice those opinions and not just contrasting um, each other's point of views and not advancing on properly governing those those technologies. Um, and so, like I said, uh, along with some colleagues, we're founding this organization called SRM Youth Watch, which has this focus on, on young people because um, that is not only our generation, but our background of working with youth organizations. And we understood that we don't have enough knowledge on SRM. And also that in the years to come, we'll be deciding on those technologies as well. So we might as well build capacity um, now to get ready for what's um, to come. And so we're in very early stages. We'll be um, formally launching the organization in, in New York this September during Climate Week and the UN General Assembly. Um, and then not only raising awareness on, and building capacity of young people, but also being able to push governments and intergovernmental organizations to talk about SRM, just as other youth constituencies connected to the UN um, have the power to do so. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know how I'm doing with time, but that's, I think I've touched on all of the points um, that, I, that I wanted to. And yes, that's it. <laughs>
Hey, thanks so much, Clara. That was really interesting, actually. It's one of the ones where it's SRM, something that I've like read, like you read like the first five paragraphs of an article and you're like, I'm getting a hand on this, but it's really good to have it all laid out in such a, a nice way. And we always do the presentation. Um, so now moving on to the next part, I'm going to allocate us half an hour like normal because we don't have too much logistical stuff to go over. So we can cut that a bit short. I know Arthur's got something to mention later on. But for now, I think we can move into the group discussion. So I hope you've all got some questions ready and waiting. And feel free to use the chat, but you can also use the raise hand function on Zoom like normal. And if anyone's got any questions at all, um, feel free to go, go for it. I've got some people are feeling too shy. But in the meantime, I'd encourage um, any of the NEVER members or staff here to raise their hands and pick Laurie, Gia Chong's and Clara's brains. Thank you. So, oh, here we go, Arthur, off you go, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eden, and thank you for the three presentation, that was really interesting. Um, I'm kind of going to jump the gun on human security, because I think this is relevant for this discussion, um, but I wanted to uh, raise the issue of human security, uh, which is a, an approach uh, that the United Nations created. I've talked about it a little bit in the uh, WhatsApp chat. And uh, I wanted to ask the, the the presentation or the presenters what, what their take is on human security, whether they think, whether they have any experience in, in working with it and implementing it, and how do they see this, uh, this approach uh, fitting with the different topics that they've mentioned, so climate, uh, SRM, and uh, Mr. Bristow, your bit of a broader presentation, but also touching on climate. Um, that would be sort of my 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 question talking about that how do you see it fitting with your with the issues that you're raising so clara jichong laurie anyone to tackle that one I, yeah i can briefly answer that um thinking of the with and without srm i think that applies to human security because we can think of scenarios where SRM would actually um, be a threat to human security. Um, say, if a country deploys and the, any of the of the SRM mechanisms and in their territory, it goes well, temperature drops and they prevent a heat wave from happening. But right across the border, that's not the situation. It actually um, causes a massive flood and then not only would this impact that population that might also cause friction between those two countries and then maybe a conflict would come up um but if we look at the perspective of um srm technologies alleviating suffering then that also touches on on human security because maybe again a huge heat wave would come and an srm would prevent this from from happening and would prevent a huge wave of climate migration from one place to the other. Um, so I believe there's a lot we can talk about human security on on it. And that's also why I think we need a lot more research being done to explore all of those different scenarios that, that can be connected to it. Um, but yeah, briefly, yes, there's a lot we can talk about uh, connecting SRM and human security. Can I pitch in on that? I think this is there's a really really important set of questions in here, um, and um, you know it, the, the the thinking is has been built out to some extent in recent years, but there's a whole lot more distance to go. So, I mean, thinking back for you know my generation of um, policy makers and government advisors and all the rest of it, um, you know when you use the word security, you tend to think in terms of military, international, hard security, so you know uh, weapon systems, balance of power, all these sorts of things. Um, one of the points I was trying to um, sort of hint at in my introductory remarks is that that world is now back with us. Um, you know, we are having to think in terms of, you know, how do you militarily deter opponents um, in Europe? I, I thought that would have gone 30 years ago, but it hasn't. Um, the, what I think we're also finding out, I mean, the, the point about polycrisis is that that's not actually all there is to it. Um, and while you're focusing on military security, you may actually be missing the thing that's going to come and get you. Um, so, you know, for an example of that, I, mean, I when in government, um, I regularly sat in meetings where we were looking at the National Risk Register, 
And of course, you know, major terrorist attack was right up there. Interstate conflict was in there, but you know, maybe less um, uh, prominent than it is now. Um, the one that was in there and we never really quite found time to talk about was pandemic flu. Um, you know, what was the thing that changed the world in the last three years in our living life? It wasn't a flu, it was a coronavirus, but nevertheless, you see, you see the point. So there, there are some things in here that I think are really important. One is around what, what works and what doesn't. If you go back through, for example, the UN Charter, you know, back in the 1940s, it's all in there, but we didn't think about it that seriously over the years. You look at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, it's all in there. Uh, but what was the uh, the pillar on which we most focused for so long? It was arms control. It was hard security. Um, debate we're having now around the consequences of the fall of um, Afghanistan in 2021. Why do we think people are turning up at the channel in boats? It's because there's nothing for them in Afghanistan. So, you know, the, the, the things are connected, but we're not great at thinking about the, the systemic linkages. While I have the floor, I just want to pick up a couple of points that um, uh, Clara and Jijong have also touched on, um, again, which I, th I think it's worth building out the thinking about. So one is intergenerational policy making. By definition, in the time scale that we're talking about for climate change, my generation of policymakers has come and gone. Um, so, you know, how, how do you deal with big, difficult policy decisions, huge policy dilemmas that are inherently working across electoral cycles in a democracy, um, most definitely working across generations, whether you're in a democracy or an authoritarian state. You know, we don't really have the tools to think about how you deal with very long term, wide ranging policy issues where there is always something more urgent to deal with right now. Um, final point on this, it's about, you know, the sort of uh, the diplomacy of all of this. Um, the, the problem I think we're grappling with um, is around um, how you deal with the sort of interface between real politics, real politics um, and things that um, take you into uh, discussions around values. I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, the sort of brutal truth of diplomacy is it's about deal making. It is most definitely not idealistic. Um, it's about you know how you reflect your understanding of your interests now and in the future. What are the trade-offs? What's your bargaining power, if any, and what's your leverage? So I think you're know, trying to bring those two things together. That's a really important part of all of this. Okay, and uh, I would like to add another idea about uh, human security, and this is the sovereignty, because the contradiction between these two norms or uh, i don't know what we got it but um the contradiction between these two is always the problem for especially in my research um, for these three important countries uh the us the un china uh for, as we all know the un the, the us um can accept to use some forced or banding action to protect human security in climate change area, especially the EU, because as we all know that it it have like more acceptance for super uh, how to say the sovereignty or power transfer, but for China, it's always described it as a defender for sovereignty, and it's always worried about the overemphasize for human security will hurt the sovereignty of other countries, especially the developing countries. And I think this is a quite huge problem uh, in the in to solve uh, let's say to uh, to do this climate governance. And uh, I think it's quite difficult to for them to negotiate about this and to get a final conclusion of uh, what are the limits for the sovereignty and the mm, uh, the human security, um, how to just uh, use those forced actions and uh, how to use that uh, national determined uh, contribution, how to use this principle for better uh, governance. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's a little... But I just want to add this idea and just come up with this. So uh, I don't know if uh, any of you have 
uh, some other ideas about these to how to solve this problem. The floor's open if anyone wants to like chip in and contribute to all these ideas. But I quite like this like discussion of like you know navigating these trade offs. Where do you put your attention? Where do you, where do you focus? What's the appropriate place for your focus? All these kinds of things. Um, so anyone wants to jump in, feel free to. If anyone's got a different question at all, I'm sure, like you know, Ji Chong, Laurie, and Clara are more than happy to answer any other any other questions you might have as well. Nadine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I don't know. I love when you guys talk about human security. I have a whole master's uh, degree in human security. I think I've mentioned it before, so it's always exciting. Um, I'm, of course, an advocate for human security. I do think that uh, the approach is a good one, but there are also limitations, of course. And I think anybody who works with something like this knows that, that there are limitations. And it comes back to um, what uh, Sir Laurie was talking about earlier about this poly crisis, that at the end of the day, you do have to prioritize because you do have to implement policies and you have to have actions on the ground. Um, and I think this is kind of the issue with human security. You're trying to do so much at once. Um, and again, are we focusing on the traditional security or this broader aspect uh, understanding of security where we're incorporating uh, environmental security, uh, but then it spills over into traditional security or economic security, food security, all of these things, right? They're all mixed together. So I'm always interested in okay, but how do we actually turn this into proper actions? And because policy at the end of the day, in a way, it's kind of unfair to say, but it is words on paper, right? And they don't really mean as much if we can't turn it into action. So I'm always super interested in the implementation. And I wonder if anybody has any reflections. I know um, someone had mentioned about this. Uh, I think it was, yeah, uh, Cheng Chung, uh, Sorry, I can't pronounce it right. Um, about this whole idea of the top down versus bottom up approach. You were talking about, I think it was something with cities, which I absolutely love. Um, uh, on how it is that, you know, maybe in reality, some of these policies should be talking more about locally led adaptation, uh, locally led uh, implementation. You know, it, there should be more of an emphasis on you know, that when we are working with these issues, it should be a bottom up approach and not always this top down approach. So I would love to hear like some reflections if anybody has on on that, especially the more actionable side of, of, of these problems. How do we actually solve them on the ground? So yeah, I, I don't, if Ji Chong, um, La, Laurie or Clara would like to pop in there with Nadine's question, and don't worry, Arthur, I can see your your hand, um, so we can get to, get to yours in a little second, but we'll, we'll wait for this one first. Unless, Arthur, you were planning to answer some of Nadine's questions just then, I'm not sure which one it was going with. Yeah, it would have been, it would have been as a, as a follow-up to Nadine. Um, so I want to make two uh, general statements. So I want to open this parenthesis very briefly and then, and then I'll close it very quickly. Um, I think it's safe to say that everyone in the world would be better off if, if human security was applied uh, to their daily life. So if everyone had you know, community security, health, economic, political, food, environment, and personal security, they, all, they would all be better off. Now, th from this statement, you have how does this translate to policy, which is what Nadine was uh, talking about. And I think that it is very critical to involve, and again, here, shameless plug for the parliamentarians. Um, it is very critical to involve parliaments because if parliamentarians don't know that human security exists, uh, they can't think of, you know, they can't, they can't see policy problems through the lens of human security. So it's very critical to educate parliamentarians and, and raise awareness of the, of the concept of human security uh, in parliamentary circles. And then uh, the, the bottom-up approach of educating uh, civil society uh, and communities to, to better understand how political prioritization could be executed through the lens of, uh, of human security as well. Um, if they understand that it's possible and that there is a framework that, um, that tries to, to better their lives, uh, then they'll be more eager to demand it of uh, the parliamentarians and, and their representative. So if we can successfully um, <clears throat> mix and match top down and bottom up uh, in, in this way, I think that's the, the, the best course for, for implementation. Now, the second generalization I wanted to make, I don't know if 
um, you know, if this is uh, just me making this uh, th this uh, or reaching this conclusion, or this is something more common. But whenever I start looking into uh, you know the counter the contemporary problems of this world, um, you start scratching the surface. You dig, you dig, you dig, and then eventually there is the question of profits that starts arising, um, and you realize that uh, a lot of awful things um, in this world are being done in the name of profit. Uh, are a lot of awful status quo are being upheld in you know an effort to continue uh, you know generating more profit and more more numbers on uh, on the uh, quarterly reports and um, so I think there is this this fundamental clash that we're finding ourselves in where there are political realities that constrain long term thinking uh, but there is this sweet spot of um, awareness raising in parliamentary circles and, and in civil society and the the so that's the parenthesis close the, the two generalization I wanted to make um, and then lastly I think um, parliamentarians have a really unique role uh, because they're elected representatives and as representatives it is theoretically and technically uh, their mission to carry the voices of the people uh, and, and their constituencies uh, to the parliament so that legislation can represent their needs and perspectives and if you if you put forward a a uh, a concept like human security then there is very few arguments against human security that can be made because ultimately um the concept is is sound but how you realize this concept and how you prioritize you know as you said nadine um it's impossible to you to see human security as a whole thing to implement all at once, because that's just too big of a task and societies are just too complex for this to, to be done. Um, so citizen engagement uh, comes in. And so renewing the understanding of parliamentarians of how they can interact with their communities, how they can account for the perspectives and, and collect the opinions of, their, of the people they represent. And once you start doing that, you start seeing that there is um, within each community a certain prioritization of all of the types of securities, right? The the, prior, the human security implementation in Denmark will be very different from the human security implementation in, in Lebanon, you know? And, and I think that uh, citizen engagement, and we're going back to the fundamentals of democracy, um, renewing those and, and bringing a, a breath of fresh air to those uh, processes I think is the way forward. And um, yeah, so that's what we're trying to do. Um, I guess, Eden, if it's not inappropriate, uh, and I know Mr. Bristol, you have your hand up, so I'll make this super short, but um, Conrad, uh, which some of you might have read some of his emails and um, and uh, message in the WhatsApp group, he has started a human security working group. Um, so we'll share more information about uh, what the working group is and how we plan to work on that. Uh, in the uh, in the big WhatsApp group very shortly. Um, so if any of you connect with the idea of human security and and connect with uh, some of what I just said um, or or find it interesting, uh, then uh, I would really encourage you to to read up a bit about it. I'm gonna post right now in the chat a, a short video of uh, that I worked on um, for the Interparliamentary Union that talks about you know human security and common security and and how those concepts can be applicable. Um, so yeah, so that, sorry, that was a bit too long, um, but it is a very complex topic. So, you know, I think talking about these is also, uh, can be also lengthy at times. Thank you. Thanks, Arthur. No worries. So we'll, first we'll go to Laurie and then we'll go to Michaela as well. Um, lots to engage with. Thanks. Well, Arthur has quite nicely set up, um, you know, what I, uh, a couple of points I wanted to cover. And um, I see um, uh, Jane has been in the chat with something similar as well. So this sort of top down and bottom up thing um, and, you know, how um, all this uh, interacts with democracy. So a few examples in case um, helpful top down in 2020, when we were working on the preparations for Glasgow, um, we were watching very closely. So which way is China going to go? Um, you know, hadn't actually declared a net zero target. Um, and all of a sudden, one popped out of the woodwork. You know, it was it was a, a commitment to achieve um, carbon neutrality, not quite the same thing as net zero by 2060, um, with some interim targets. And we looked at this and you know, scratched my head for a while about, so why have they done this now? Um, and I think it came down to really two fundamental points. One is it's the domestic, economic, um, and uh, political drivers. China has a set of environmental problems. 
um, and it has um, a, a, a you know a question of as to how it uh, builds out its economy, um, how it seizes the advantage from its ownership of intellectual property and industrial uh, power and all the rest of it um, through the carbon transition. I mean, the short answer is it made sense to the Chinese economy and to the Chinese Communist Party domestically, internally to do that. Internationally, it also made sense because, of course, what everyone else was watching at the time was the US election. So you've got you know, two scenarios coming up, a Trump presidency or a Biden presidency with a complete fork in the ways, depending on which one it was. Um, and in geopolitical negotiating terms, this was an absolute no brainer for the government in Beijing. So if it's a Trump presidency, you've you've got the high ground. And if it's a Biden presidency, you've got first mover advantage, you're making the weather um, going into COP26. So what's not to like? So th th this is a point about you're just thinking, uh, they're thinking geopolitically about how decisions get made at that sort of level. And the things came together. I mean, you know, the 2060 commitment wasn't good enough, but it was good enough in, in the circumstances to start moving the argument forward. Other end of the telescope, shameless advert for the college I now run, we have a thing called the, the Center for Climate Engagement. What it does is provide training and support to non-executive directors um, in companies, publicly listed companies. NEDs are important because their job is to step back from the daily running of the company and to ask the difficult questions. Um, are we attending to the future of our company? Does this company have an operating model in 10 years time? Do we have a license to operate? Are we producing products, services that people want to buy? And so what the Center for Climate Engagement does is work with non-executive directors to enable them to change behavior on corporate boards, you know, through asking those kinds of questions. Um, and any corporate board that is earning its keep will be listening to its NEDs and you know, saying, you've got a good point there. Actually, we haven't got a company in 10 years time unless we address these questions now. Um, final point around democratic deficit, so a completely different tangent. I think a, a really important thing to think about here is how is the question uh, posed? What is the question? So moving to something else that I'm working on for the moment for very obvious reasons, Afghanistan. Afghanistan and girls' education. The Taliban have banned girls from school. Why is this our problem? We're out of Afghanistan. Well, it's like this. Um, what kind of society do you get when you ban half the population from schools? Um, why did we get to the situation we had in 9-11-2001, where the Taliban were hosting al-Qaeda, who came to attack us? Go figure. You know, th this is the point about um, uh, you know, the connection between human security, hard security, policy choices now that don't look like they're the top of your pile. But if you neglect them, they're going to come and get you. Thanks, Laurie. That was brilliant. Then it's very good point about, you know, don't ignore the monsters under the bed because you've got another one standing in front of you already. Um, we're going to move on to Michaela now because I can see you've got your hand up. But I've also got a message in the ch uh, question in the chat from Anna. So Michaela first, and then I'll, I'll read out and Anna's for her as well. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll lower my hand now so it doesn't stay up there. Uh, I'm Michaela, currently uh, sitting in a very overcast Copenhagen right now. Uh, and I just sort of had a bit of a, a comment on uh, what Nadine was saying about implementation, because I think that that's, you know, one of the most important uh, links in, in our work and also something that I think is the weakest spot uh, in, in many cases. I mean, I've worked on a lot of projects and the hardest part and the most ineffective part is actually implementation. Um, so many things fail. And I think that, you know, global governance as it stands now is extremely broken. I mean, our mechanisms are failing us. Uh, I mean, as a young person, you know, it's it's quite impossible to either, you know, like enter some spaces and do something. We're feeling quite helpless. And you know, I think what what my sort of analysis, because I've also worked and I really learned this when I was working at a gender and development consultancy in Mozambique, uh, where there are just so many silos in, in global governance. You know, I think, you know, this talk about how do you connect uh, the bottom up and the top down together and how to sort of bridge the gaps. Uh, that's where the answer lies, because if you look at any sort of, you know, like academic analysis, especially from the gender space, they always point out that the mechanisms, you know, kind of filling the gaps between the top down and the bottom up are completely missing. And you see this, 
in many countries, you know, Afghanistan has been mentioned, there's no way, there's a lot of groups, uh, women's rights groups, um, trying to do things, trying to take cases to the government, but there's no mechanism for them to get to the, um, from the civil society to the um, sort of top down uh, spaces and the policy making spaces. And I think that's also quite uh, intentional on the part of um, global governance where it's quite, you know, we all have our spaces, civil society stays here, they can make as much noise as they want, but where's their power, they can do as much bottom up uh, sort of work. Uh, and we also do as much bottom up work as we can. Uh, but as soon as you know, you want to sort of fill the gaps, you get smacked down. And you can also see this, uh, I also come from a nuclear disarmament background, so many grassroots organizations from the bottom up trying to, you know, claw the way to the um, the top down spaces where policy and impact can be made and you just get smacked down. Uh, so I think that if you really want to find the problems and solve problems within implementation, you need to really look at filling the gaps uh, between the top, uh, the bottom uh, up and the top down spaces, because that's really uh, the weak spot of global governance uh, and you know how we can sort of work together to fix various problems. So I think there needs to be a large restructuring um, of a lot of top uh, top um, down things. So I think that's uh, sort of my two cents on that. Amazing, thanks so much, Michaela. And anyone to grapple with, um, with Michaela's two cents <laughs> just then before we move on to Anna's question? No, lovely. We'll move, we'll move on to Anna's one in that case. And I'm sure, to be honest, people are going to have like thoughts and ideas within five minutes. People are thinking still. <laughs> so um, Anna said that Laurie emphasised the difference between Western and Eastern climate policies. Um, but then obviously elections in America, Trump, DeSantis, not exactly the friendliest to climate initiatives, full stop. Um, and so this is a question for the speakers so far. Who's the lesser of two evils? And does anyone anticipate if there is a DeSantis or a Trump presidency, what well, a second Trump presidency, whether or not another country or another organization could take on the climate messiah? I like that. Actually, I'm going to use that in future climate messiah role. Um, so, yeah, over to the panel or anyone else who's got any input. Shall I pick that one up first? OK, well, uh, first of all, just to be absolutely clear, I am not going to comment um, in any way um, on you know, um, uh, Trump or DeSantis or any other um, um, uh, potential candidate in the US elections. Um, but let, let's sort of step back from this a bit. I mean, two things. Um, one is um, this is not the first time we've had to deal with this question. Um, so that, you know, there was um, uh, the time of the last election, you know, the election could have gone both ways. Um, and as in many countries, the history of climate policy in the US has come and gone a bit, to say the, the least. Um, so, I mean, the, the thing that really follows me from that um, is what should plan B? Um, you know, what is the next best option? This is the, the, the fundamental question in all political decision making. If you can't have exactly what you want, um, you know, what is the next best thing? What will get you to what you need to achieve? Um, and I think, you know, the um, the debate has moved on quite a lot, even in the last two or three years. So um, the sorts of areas I would be looking at there um, are, first of all, the subnational level. Uh, so particularly in the US, um, you know, there are also the states um, and there are cities. And this is something we were looking at, you know, in the run up to COP26, how powerful local government, city government, um, state government and federal entities can be to drive policy change. Um, second is consumer behavior. In the broadest sense, um, you know, what are the things that people value um, when they're making buying choices um, or um, any any form of choice? That seems to me to be a question that you know we all need to think about really rather more seriously, not least because it also helps you address this question of the democratic deficit in all of this. What are the individual choices that people make that um, that have an impact um, or are indeed driven by uh, policy choices? Um, I mean, the other one is, um, you know, it's not just the US. Um, you know, the, um, there are um, a, a number of major emitters in the world, um, a number of people who are big players in the field of, for example, um, you know, nature and biodiversity. Um, it's, uh, it's really wrong as well as bad politics simply to demonize the US um, on this, regardless of whether you like the outcome of elections or not. Um, you know, you can't really answer this question without looking at, for example, forests in the Amazon um, or forests in Siberia. Got two problematic governments there. 
Um, you know, the question around industrial policy, is it driving change fast enough and hard enough? Uh, that's a question for basically all serious economies. Um, so yeah, that's probably all I really need to say about that. Thanks. Amazing. Thanks, Laurie. Um, anyone else want to chip in at all? Crickets. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, is any more questions actually on a different topic at all in that case, if anyone wants to raise anything whilst they're here, because I've allocated us another five minutes or so because we're in the flow of it. But um, if not, we could potentially start winding down. But um, I want to make sure everyone's had their say before we start doing anything like that. So feel free to raise your hand or put things in the chat. Lovely. Well, I'm just going to quickly through my notes because Nathan and I wanted to go on before we move on to the more logistical side of the meeting. Um, yeah, I'm all good. In that case, we'll move on to a slightly less interesting note. Um, I'd like to thank, before we move on to the logistical part, Laurie, Clara, Ji Chong, thanks so much. It's been amazing. We've really, really enjoyed hearing from you and I've loved the group discussion as well. It's really interesting. As per usual, I'm going to save the chat and send that out to everyone so you can look at all the links and resources that people have sent out. As you've seen, we've been recording this session throughout and I'll be putting it on the ELN's website after I've managed to put a fun slideshow transition at the start to make it look nice and slick and professional. So you can all enjoy that at your leisure later on. Uh, I'm going to stop recording now.